Hi, nerds. I hope you're excited for this episode of the Professional Book Nerds podcast. Some housekeeping before we dive in with this really fantastic author today. Make sure you're following us at Pro Book Nerds on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You can always send us a note or episode suggestions to our email or professionalbooknerds at overdrive.com. Now, today's author does not need an introduction by any means, but I will give one. So Rebecca Yaros is the USA Today bestselling author of more than 15 novels with multiple starred Publishers Weekly Reviews and a Kirkus Best Book of the Year. A second generation army brat, Rebecca loves military heroes and has been blissfully married to hers for more than 20 years. She's the mother of six children and she and her family live in Colorado with their stubborn English bulldogs, two feisty chinchillas, and a cat named Artemis who rules them all. We are talking today about her books in the Empyrean series, so that includes Fourth Wing and the highly anticipated sequel, Iron Flame, which comes out on November 7th. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Happy listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this special episode of the Professional Book Nerds. I am very excited to announce today's guest, Rebecca Yaros. Rebecca, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm like uh, kicking my feet and like doing a shimmy, <laughs> which uh, listeners can't see because this is audio. Uh, but I'm so excited to have you here to talk about Iron Flame. This comes out on November 7th. Yes. I like people are chomping at the bit for this book, but to kick us off, <laughs> can you tell us what Iron Flame is about? Sure. I mean, it's the sequel to Fourth Wing. And if you haven't read Fourth Wing, that's totally fine too. Um, so basically, for those who have read Fourth Wing, it is basically following Violet and how she deals with what she's just learned in the fallout of book one, what she's going to do with that information, and how she's going to evolve now that um basically everything she thinks she knows, which is kind of what her self-worth is based on, has just been ripped out from underneath her. So just a few things that she's got to work out in just book a little two. Bit. I mean, <laughs> 21 year old drama, you know what I mean? She doesn't right. have these problems at 21, the world ending, all that, you know, it's just exactly. I mean, war college, you know, just right? normal things. Dragons. Uh, <laughs> dragons. Exactly. So I know that there's not a ton we can say about Iron Flame specifically. Readers are just going to have to dive right in at midnight on the release day. But Fourth Wing only came out in May of this year. We're yeah. already getting the sequel. I'm so jazzed we don't have to wait too long. Um, what's been the writing process like for these books? Like that's a pretty quick, like we're very lucky to get two books in one year. It was, um, it was intense. I think intense is a good word for it. I wrote fourth wing in a total of like two and a half months, but I'd been plotting it. I know, right. Um, which is it's typical for me in a book, but, um, I started plotting it in April and I turned in the first 10 pages and they said, Hey, you're going to launch the line, which shocked me because I was just excited to get to write a fantasy. Uh, cause it's my favorite genre. And then next thing I know, um, I had to finish another book that was coming out in October. And then I wrote all of it in June and July, other than the first like 50 pages. So I wrote it in two and a half months. And then we got the edits done and turned in because it has to be done so like far in advance for the dragons, the dragon edges, the stencils. Yes. So <laughs> next thing I know, they're like, hey, we, we kind of want to accelerate it. What do you think? And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll write the next one. And I had just written another book called In the Likely Event. And then I jumped back in and wrote Iron Flame. And so I think it was in like a, and 12 month period between all of my books, I wrote like 851,000 words and I will not do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say like, like, we can't, we set the bar very high. That's not going to be the, uh, the schedule and cadence we get for the rest of the no, series. We're going <laughs> to slow it down. I mean, nothing that's going to appall everybody, but, um, we just have to, I have a chronic illness. I have the same chronic illness that Violet has. And it just, I pushed my body so far just to make sure that, you know, we had the sequel coming out in a, in a timely fashion that would keep everybody, you know, keep everybody, I don't say happy, um, enthralled, you know, to make sure that we kind of, we can secure the readers. Uh, but I just, I have to slow it down a little bit for my own personal health. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah, two books in a like knockout series in one year is fantastic. I think 
as fans and readers, we can definitely slow it down a little bit. Maybe not too slow though. <laughs> well, not, not too, not too not slow. Too but slow but. So we haven't announced the the date for the third book coming out. So I can't, I can't spoil that, but it's, um, it's just, it will not be this fast. We'll put it that way. A more traditionally published cadence for a, a series. More, <laughs> and more, more than that, just a more sustainable cadence. I think because I went straight into Iron Flame and then into the edits for Iron Flame. And I hadn't slept in like 18 months. I hadn't had a vacation. I had barely seen like my kids. And I remember getting home from like the European tour for um, Fourth Wing. I just did a quick promo tour in England and in Germany. And um, I was home and my business manager called. And one of my kids was like, you've been home for half an hour and the phone's already ringing. And I'm like, yeah, this is too much. This is, this is, this is too much. So um, we're just going to, I'm going to, you know, bring a little bit more balance back to the work life balance idea. Yeah. Very important though. And so part of that, I'm curious, like for you, what has it been like experiencing just sort of the overwhelming and like massive, I'll call them fandom myself included, that sort of rallied around fourth wing and all of these characters, like your book was so it was out of stock. Like it was a hot commodity. Um, like I embarrassed, I don't, I'm not embarrassed by this because I am dedicated, but I did like, I Googled the book ISBN, like looked at all of my go-to local booksellers to find the sprayed dragon edges, tracked down the last copy at a bookstore in Pennsylvania and was like, it's mine. I called them. I ordered, I was like, it's send it. And they sent it that day. They sent it that afternoon. I never even thought to to do that, <laughs> to track it by SB. And that never occurred to me. That's amazing. Um, so I, I think, I don't know. I always feel odd saying this. I, I wasn't prepared. Um, I don't think any of us really were. I think my editor, who is also my publisher, she just, she knew, I think she knew she had something and she's like, you need to be prepared. And I'm like, all right. Because I think when you've been in publishing 10 years, you often, hear, this is the book, this is the book, or this book doesn't list, nothing will. And, and so at this point, I'm just like, I just want to write a fantasy. I want to have one book a year that I get to go play with dragons and magic and, and have fun with it. And so I never expected this. And then the readers have been so amazing. And especially that first, like when all the arcs went out and everything was coming in, I was terrified. I was so terrified. Um, the reviews would tell me to stay in my lane, that I just needed to stay in romance. And I remembered my editor called and told me I had a starred review in Publishers Weekly for it, which is like um like an like award of excellence kind of yeah. thing. And I bawled. Like I just I don't cry. Like I'm not a crier. And I just started crying because it felt like I was allowed out of my lane. Cause I think mm-hmm. in publishing you kind of get put in your little branded box. So it's been amazing to see like the reactions from the readers has been truly humbling and overwhelming at times. And for the most part, I don't realize like how big it is. Cause I'm just me in my basement. Yeah. Like, my kids, my kids don't care. Like I'm still not cool. Right. So it doesn't like, affect <laughs> my whole life. Yeah. Um, and then I do things like go to Las Vegas and I see all the readers are Comic-Con and I'm like, Oh, hi guys. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's just overwhelming. It's surreal. I think surreal is the, to wrap that up surreal. It's been really cool to see. And I'm admittedly like as a fan and a a reader, um, almost a little bit like, dang, everyone else is in this club. And now, you know, then there's like, um, you know, a hot, a hot run on the sprayed edges, but, um, we have, I know you have some exciting things coming sprayed edges included, which we'll get to in a minute, but I do want to ask you, how does your background in history contribute to the creation of this world and this story with um, Violet and Zayden and all of these dragons and cool characters? So I always, um, or I was taught rather that in, even when you're writing fantasy, a story has to stand on its own without the fantastical elements, right? So if Taryn's just a person and Sigail is just a person, does the story stand on its own? And I'm kind of looking at our current political climate and our current you know, our, our country and I'm watching history being taken out of our textbooks. And because I'm a history major, to me, history is history. You can't change it. And I just realized all the things that might not be getting taught and how that affects the society and what happens when you start controlling access to history and you start controlling access to books. Because really at its heart, 
fourth wing is really about weaponizing ignorance and what happens when you when you ban books and you alter history to suit your own purposes. So it was more of an influence there because in fantasy, like I don't have to do like historical research other than making sure that I'm not like culturally appropriating dragons and I'm only using like Western dragons, right? That I have to definitely dive in and look and some etymology. I remember, um, so it's like the history of vocabulary, right? We were doing Iron Flame and I used this term umbrella and it got flagged. And so I'm like, this is too modern. And I'm like, umbrellas have been around for 3000 years. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, what? It's like 3000 years. Umbrellas have been around for 3000 years or things like, you know, when people are okay with someone saying like storm the keep and storming the keep, I think came around in like the 1600s with Oliver Cromwell or something like that. And I'm like, but guys, then you should be fine with my like Gregorian calendar. You should be fine with like the study of etymology is more where I dug in for research purposes. But in the end, we decided to make the book as accessible as possible mm-hmm. and make sure that my goal is to bring non-fantasy readers into fantasy. So we made the vernacular more modern and more approachable. And we put our translation guide, our translation note at the front of it. So those are the two ways that history really played into it. I love that. And I know for me in reading it, I do love all of the little like excerpts at the beginning of each chapter of like various sources and things. Thank you. I am um, initially, I mean, that's very common in some books. And so initially it like it ideally leads to lends itself to the story, but I don't always pay super close attention to it. But like a couple of chapters and I was like, oh, wait, wait, have to go back. We need to be paying attention to all of these bits. Yeah. So that was very clever. I, I really love that sort of inclusion of all of those different elements in the story. Um, yeah. Now, where did the mythology for things like the Venon and the Wyvern come from? So, um, at first I fell in love with the concept of dragons and really kind of like what happens in a, in a forced proximity and an enemies to lover situation, like with, with faded mates. Right. So I knew I wanted the dragons to be, to be mated, but then you look at it and you're, you're good. You're, you're good people. You're heroes. I'm so good at this. Your heroes are only as good as the evil they have to conquer. So you have to look at something like what is equal, what's going to scare a dragon. Because it's pretty, it's made pretty clear that the Griffin Riders do some damage, right? They do some damage, but in reality, they're not much competition for a dragon. So you need to bring something out that's as bad as a dragon. And those are wyvern. Those are, you know, those are wyvern. Those are as bad as dragons. And those are created by Venon. And I was enthralled with the concept of if you have a society where there's magic in the land, but the only people who have access to it are chosen by griffins or by dragons that's going to make some people really, really mad. Because I think a universal human theme is the thirst and hunger for power. So if there's a way to, you know, barter your soul for that power, I think there are people who will do that. People who will give up their soul for power. And that's where the venom come in. It's just, it's humanity's need to grasp at power and what you're willing to sell for it. That's so true. And I think that that's a really interesting point where like the dragons are elite in their society. And so you do need to have something that is truly a danger to them and sort of at that level where they do need to be concerned because right. like there's a lot that dragons can overcome, yeah. but right. It's got to be, the stakes have to be raised. <laughs> right. Cause otherwise you're like, why am I nervous about Griffins? You already said they're not a big deal. And there's not really, there's not a reason to, to, to be worried for their safety. And then you lose all your intensity. Absolutely. That's such a good point, though. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that this series, there are definitely moments where you're just like, you know, clutching the pages like, oh, my gosh, what is happening? Yeah, I'm not afraid to kill people. I never have. I mean, in, in, on the page, on the page, let's just on the know, page <laughs> as, as that like gets drawn out in some quote. Like, hey, you're also not afraid to. No, I'm never afraid to kill characters on the page that it's it's throughout all of my books. Yeah. I mean, there, I felt that there's one in particular in fourth wing, uh, where I, it took me a while to recover. Um, you probably guess which one. I know. I know. I know. The amount of messages I get on that character's behalf. I know. It's yeah. I, I mean, I forgive you and have recovered, but it was a very sad moment for sure. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I'm not, but I am, but I'm not, it just depends. 
I, I mean, it's for the storytelling and it's a fantastic story to be told. Yeah. I think it's an important fact to make um, just because I'm it's so funny because people think I'm pro-military and I'm so anti-war because I've, I've sent my husband to war so many times. Um, I like to drive it home that when you send your loved ones to war, they don't all come back, that it's not mm-hmm. some you know, magical, even though you're in a book, war, war takes the people that we love uh, you know, from us. And I'm so sorry that everyone loves that character and that that character is no longer with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there were some characters that I'm like, this is a, this is a brief fourth wing spoiler. So if you've not read fourth wing yet, skip ahead. Um, But the end of fourth wing, we leave ourselves on quite a reveal cliffhanger. And then do we, we sort of have to see where we pick back up with all of that in iron flame. So that was, I think I wrote the beginning of iron flame three times um, trying to figure out how to not just write out of that situation, but make sure it it kept that intensity and you get the answers that you need, but not all the answers that you want. And you are left on a cliffhanger. Um, especially, gosh, it's so hard because I always feel like, oh, everyone will have read fourth wing by now, but but it's only been out six months. So Mm -hmm. it's like, I I don't want to spoil it. Um, let's just say that this is so difficult. I know. <laughs> if anyone could see me right now, I'm like staring around my office looking for a way to phrase this. It's not gonna be like, and in the beginning, um, right. So basically the beginning of that book, you have to Violet has to deal with what she's just learned, what's been hidden from her, the people she thought she could trust that she couldn't, and the people she now has all new reasons to be angry at, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. if people think she was mad at the end of the last book, ooh. She's she's a little madder now. Um, and writing out of that, it was just a natural place. There was no way to skip a month or, you know, or skip a few months or and say, now we're back here. You have to bring her back to exactly where she's at. Otherwise, you you cheat the reader out, out of the experience of watching her handle that. I don't know if you can answer this without spoiling. So it's okay if not. Okay. All right. What do you think then? So bringing Zayden and Violet sort of to the forefront. What do you think is the biggest obstacle facing them as we head into Iron Flame? So an obstacle for Violet is she doesn't know if she can trust him. And because it's not just Zayden who has lied to her. She's realizing that there are ranks of people who could have lied to her. And she doesn't know who to trust. She doesn't know if Dane has lied to her the whole time. She only knows the consequences of what his actions may have been. She doesn't know if her mother's been lying to her. She doesn't know if her sister has been lying to her. She does know that, you know, someone else that pops up at the end of Fourth Wing definitely lied and put her through a lot of unnecessary pain. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Zayden. So she is lost what she believes in. Her entire self-worth is based on her wit and being trained as a scribe. And now that's been ripped out from underneath her. So she doesn't even trust what she knows. Mm-hmm. So a major issue for her personally is who can she trust? And Zayden's going to get the brunt of that because he's, you know, he's the one who revealed it. As for Zayden, I think his challenge is he's never really loved anyone and he doesn't remember what it feels like to be loved. And so he doesn't know the correct ways to fight for someone because he, he has such a ruthless streak in him that he's, he just snaps people off and, let, and lets them go. And he, and he can't let Violet go. So you have this push and pull of how do you form a healthy relationship in those dynamics? Because I'm all about healthy, non-toxic relationships. So that's their biggest challenge. Plus they have the dragons and a war. Absolutely. So yeah. out, right outside of the larger, like, society war right. <laughs> like potential I censorship dragons yeah. they do need to work on their communication <laughs> yeah i think it's, I, I think um <laughs> i think that is that is goes without without saying and especially even i mean even her closest bond is with taryn and taryn hasn't let her in because dragons don't ever like humans all the way in so there's so much trust. This whole book is about how you trust someone and how you can trust someone without knowing the full truth, without knowing every single thing about them. Um, and yes, there's a giant war and danger coming. So like, you know, typical sophomore year at college. It's fine. So I know you've said previously that this is a five book series. It is. Is that still the case? Yeah. Okay. 
And I'm not, I mean, I always, I always say never say never, right? Because something could happen and a story could expand or something like that. But when I sat down to write Iron Flame, um, because, you know, we are, we're, we're crossing the threshold of summer. So anyone who reads Fourth Wing knows that conscription day is in the middle of summer. So graduation would have occurred. So basically because of the timeline that you have to kind of follow and because Segal and Taryn can't be apart for too long, everything had to be ske- very, very, very regimentally scheduled. And I called my editor and said, hey, I think this is five books and here's why. I think this book takes place over six months. I think this is six months. I think this is this. And this is how this arcs over each story. I want you to think about it and then tell me if you want to do this. It's a huge investment. She's like, no, five books done. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Think about it. She's like, no, five books done. I was like, oh, yeah. So yes, it is. It is five. It's fully plotted. Um, my publisher has the synopsis and everything. Well, thank you to them for immediately agreeing to the five books. <laughs> uh, can't wait. And I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but okay. are Violet and Zayden end game or is that for us to find out? I mean, I will tell you that I believe in happily ever afters. It just depends on, I mean, Violet's our main character. <laughs> so I believe in happily ever afters and I'm a romance writer and fourth wing is a romance to see at heart. So while I'm sure I would be trampled upon by my publisher, if I'm like, here's how the whole thing ends. I will just say that I'm a romance writer. You believe in happily ever afters. Yeah. Okay. I think that's. But Violet's the main character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just we'll go that on. Okay. So with that very important caveat. Speaking of tricky relationships, do you think that Violet and Dane's friendship will ever recover from the events of Fourth Wing? My gosh, so I'm the ultimate Dane apologist and everyone like drags me for it Um, because I know I knew Dane's arc before I started writing Fourth Wing and I knew what moments were coming for him in Iron Flame. Um, And I think that Dane gets a bad, not a bad rap. But I think you only see one side of the situation when you are in like a single POV. So you're only in Violet. So you have no idea what Dane's thinking. You have no idea if he's actually been taking her memories the whole time. You have no idea like what he's actually been doing. Um, will it ever be the same? I don't know. I mean, if you have a best friend, someone that's been your best friend since childhood and they make such an egregious mistake or an egregious or decision that causes, has such catastrophic consequences, can you forgive that person? Do you want to forgive that person? Does that person even earn your forgiveness? Are they even sorry? I think those are things that you that you have to kind of walk into fourth wing knowing because the whole question of fourth wing is really if you have a shield and your neighbor desperately needs that shield to make a sword, are you going to give up your shield? Are you going to endanger your own people to be the sword for your neighbor? That's the whole that's the whole question there. And some people will and some people don't. And like, I can tell you in my house, I would, my husband wouldn't, Mm -hmm. my husband would be like, no, 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 my kids and my wife, my kids and my wife. Right. So it's, will it ever be the same? I mean, probably not the same, but Violet and Zayden aren't going to be the same as they were in the last book. Violet and Rihanna aren't the same. Uh, Violet and Imogen aren't the same. Every relationship changes and evolves due to what decisions people make and, and how they move forward with them. Right. I think Dane gets a lot of haters. Uh, he, <laughs> he really does. I can't even tell you how many times I get like handed a book was like, will you write this? And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> like, I will not. But I think people also forget that like Violet assumes that Dane will be who she remembers. And as Violet is not the same as she was at the beginning of fourth wing, she's been through that entire year. Dane just went through that entire year. Yeah. Dane's not who she remembers either. And Dane's an example of the love you think you you need. But as you, you know, in your 20s, you start to see what you think you need and what you actually need are not necessarily the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Like what she may have pictured is not, doesn't yeah. necessarily turn out to be what she thought it was. Right. She's a freshman in college in fourth wing. Like she's a, like, that's what 20 for them is a freshman year in college. And yeah. I always love it because I always say new adult is like 2 a.m. in a girl's bathroom. Right. And, and someone's puking and holding their hair back. The other person's like, I just want to text and like, don't text your ex, you're that like do you know what I mean like that messy just oh to be 20 (laughs) I know (laughs) know? (laughs) I know my kids are 20 when I think about it I'm like oh god okay yeah like in that context they're all like in college they're all learning a lot of different I mean as adults and then right in this whole new role as writers and that's a lot 
<laughs> and people, people who think that Zayden's perfect or he's going to be perfect. I'm like, or he gets compared a lot to like Resand, right? Like Zayden is 23. He is 23 and he makes 23 year old mistakes and he makes 23 year old decisions. And he's, he's not ancient. He's not, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he's not 500. <laughs> right. These are 20 year old, you know, like new adults just trying to yeah. figure out like adulthood in general, their frontal lobes aren't even fully developed. <laughs> like, right. You know. They're going to make mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. If they don't. Sheesh. I know. And, but I think that that adds a really nice element though, to the books, because you know, it makes some of those elements more relatable when we're in these fantastical settings. Right. I wouldn't mind if I could have Taryn in my backyard, I'd be cool with it. But not the girl. Not the girl. I don't think, I don't know. But Taryn, I would, I'd have Taryn all, all day long. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of, do you have a favorite dragon? Is that like asking yeah. for your favorite kid? No, it's not because it's Taryn. <laughs> Taren, Taren is my favorite. Um, he's the first, like he was the first thing I envisioned when fourth wing came to mind was him selecting Violet, who is, you know, frail and breakable because she has Ehlers Stanlos. Um, and being one of the strongest, most revered battle dragons and choosing someone who everyone's like, you chose what? Like, like when you're doing like Red Rover, right? And you're trying to get like the stronger teammate over, and he's like, I'll take that one. You know what I mean? Like the small, frail one. So it's always been Taryn. He was modeled on um, our English bulldog who um, Diesel passed before fourth wing was finished. But he was like 12 and a half. Like when everyone says, I'm so sorry. I'm like, dude, no, he was ancient. Like he was like ancient in bulldog years. But he had a very much get off my lawn energy, which is what inspires Taryn. Because Taryn is just, he's had it. He's an absolute curmudgeon. He's, he's a grump. He wants no part of this. He didn't want to bond in the first place. And he is just my favorite because he is so respectful of Violet and yet so sarcastically just done with her all in the same breath. Yeah. Their relationship has really been fun to read uh, in Fourth Wing and Iron Flame. I like that you called him a curmudgeon. That seems like it fits. (laughs) He's like, get off my lawn, you. And all I can imagine, he's like 100 years old, right? So he's like middle age for a dragon. And like, I can just imagine him, like he didn't want to bond after, you know, his last writer passed and now he's bonded again and he's stuck in 20 year old drama. He's a hundred year old dragon who is in her head constantly. And he's just like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. And I can just see him just like, no, no, stop it. Like all of you just, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly funny with the added dynamics. You know, he's got the relationship drama between Violet and Zayden. He's got his own relationship to contend with, with and yeah. And Nar- oh my gosh, I can't speak English. Okay. And Darna. Darna. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's like especially uh some of the things in Iron Flame, there's a lot of that sort of angst going on. <laughs> yeah, there's everybody. And I love it. Um Iron Flame really doesn't Because the dragons are so secretive and they have their own politics and their own society and they're never going to let the humans fully into it. And there's reasons for that. Um, Because the humans are really the pets to the dragons. The dragons are the superior species, right? And I do love, like, Taryn has taken Andarna, like, under his wing, but he fully states in Fourth Wing. It's because Sigil took a liking to the little one, right? And so now he's like, I have this 20-year-old girl who can't stay on my back and she's just whatever she's going over here. And I've got this baby dragon who listens to no one. And this poor guy just like needs, he needs like a vacation at Club Med. Like he needs to like just go on vacation and not have any of this. Yeah, he's he's got his work cut out for him to keep everybody in check. <laughs> he does, but I love getting to see like certain events in Iron Flame that happen. You get to see some of even like the evolution between him and Sigale, not necessarily fully because you're never in his head and he's never going to let Violet fully in, but you can kind of see the things, you know, the things that are going on. And I love watching that evolution for him. I do too. And so speaking of uh, relationships and sort of families, will we learn more about Violet's family, like in future books? I'm particularly interested in her father and getting a little bit more of that backstory. So I think in this book, you're so focused on immediate danger and immediate death and immediate who she can trust in this book. And because her father's already passed, yes, you will, just not as heavily in this book. And there's all the things that 
I think if there are questions, I mean, there are going to be tons of questions that readers still have after book two, those will be coming in, in later books. But I think like book two is a triage. Does that make sense? Like you're just dealing with what's exactly in front of you at the moment because holy crap. And then, yeah, yes. So yes, the answer is yes. In later books. I'm glad to hear it as much as you are allowed to share. I'm excited to see that we might get some more of that backstory in future books. Uh, Now, something else I wanted to talk about is your book tour. You're going on a book tour for Mm -hmm. Iron Flame. It's sold out in minutes. There was like a hacking situation. (laughs) Yeah. Um, People are very excited, though, to see you. What are you most looking forward to? Um, When I was floored. I thought maybe it might sell out, like maybe after like a month or something, I, I, it never occurred to me. It would be like two to three minutes. It never, like, I think I just stared in shock, like literally shock. And then the hacking and I got hacked twice and the FBI got involved. And it was just like, what is going on? Um, I'm excited to see everyone. I love meeting readers. So I'm excited to see everyone that's going to come and be happy and excited. Cause who doesn't want like a happy festive environment? And um, I think reading gives us this really beautiful escapism and it brings us together as a community. And I love going to signings because you see people who meet in line and are suddenly friends because they've been in line and people are like, oh, we just became best friends. I'm like, amazing. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'm super excited. I'll have my sister with me for, for most of it. So I love getting to spend time with my sister and um, I got to buy some new black dresses because I'm like, writers wear black. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I am very excited that you'll be on book tour. Sadly missed out on the date and tickets as we yeah. talked about. <laughs> I refreshed and it like, right. You refreshed and it was gone. All the tickets were gone. <laughs> so sorry. I took it too casually. So, uh, but yeah, it's just exciting that you'll be uh, seeing readers out on the road. Thank you. It's I'm, I'm excited. It's, and there's only, I know there, there are a lot of questions as to why there aren't more stops. Um, and it's because I have Ehlers Danlos. So they have to a lot time for me to pre-sign the books because I wanted to make sure that each reader had a more personal experience than what the original plan was. And so I have to go pre-sign all the books and then I have to, you know, sign them, not sign them again, but like do the personalization and stuff when the readers are there and it kills my body. I have POTS. So when I stand up, I pass out if I'm in certain things like travel will trigger that and not sleeping enough. So they had to space out the days so that I can make it through the tour. So I'm really sorry that there's only this many days Anyone who's listening. Um, But it really, it's one thing to write about a chronic illness and another thing to actually accept the accommodations you, you have to have. And I just, I, I can't do that many days back to back. No, and I think that that's a really good point for, you know, for readers and people to understand that the sort of effort that it takes to do these big book tours, like it's travel, it's a lot of stops. I think it's exhausting for anyone. And then to take, you know, those other things into consideration, you've got to do what you've got to do to make sure that you are healthy and able, you know, and so I think readers will appreciate all of the care and and attention that went into the book tour. And there will be plenty more books is what uh, we keep telling ourselves. So be lots more chances. Plenty more books. <laughs> and as I keep saying, um, I have to stay home and write them too. So yeah. <laughs> in order to write the books, I can't, I can't be out all the time. So, and I get wicked social anxiety, which is like why my sister comes with me on everything. She's like my security blanket. Do you know what I mean? So it's, um, I'm, I'm super excited to do it. Um, again, it's surreal to think that many people want to come out and get a signed book. Like that is, that's surreal. My, my kids are like, people really care. I'm like, be quiet. Like your mom's cool. No, they'll no. keep you grounded. <laughs> oh yeah. For sure. <laughs> oh, so yeah. There's no ego growing over here. Not when you're raising teenage boys. Mm-mm, no. Like, oh, I have I've got a toddler, but I look forward to the teen years. <laughs> They're great. They're absolutely great. I love watching my sons. Um, my daughter's 10 and my oldest daughter is already grown and she's an adult. And so I'm really enjoying watching my sons grow, growing into their manhood and like growing into young men. It's really, it's fascinating. Friendly a wild ride for sure. <laughs> Something else I really wanted to ask you about is that recently there was a mystery listing 
um, huh? from Red Tower, the sort of oh. untitled Red Tower release yeah. that everyone was trying to figure out what a book could possibly be coming out on November 7th, the same mm-hmm. day as Iron Flame. It's a special edition fourth wing. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk about <laughs> what that was like to see it just sort of like take off without <laughs> it much? Leash? Yes, yeah. <laughs> sure. And it's so funny because I have like, I have my name blocked on TikTok and I haven't been on TikTok in weeks. Um, It's so, it's, it's better for my mental health. Um, But when it was started to like kind of go out, the whole plan was to surprise the readers like, hey guys, Iron Flame is here. And if you wanted like edges to match, we have additional four I just will match just the straight black, right? But then they put it up on pre-order and then suddenly people find it. And suddenly the theories are going like, well, they're not going to put another book up against her. And I'm just over here like, and you can't, I guess people are listening. They can't hear me. My eyes are just getting wider and wider and wider. And I'm like, oh my, like, how is it found? How the heck is that? Like, what the heck is going on? Like, like, I think readers could probably like put the FBI to shame. And, and the next thing I know, I think, one of the retailers leaked my name for 10 minutes. My publisher immediately caught it and got it down. But by then it was already out. And then next thing I know, another retailer puts up the full description and it comes Then my publisher jumps on it and pulls it down. And then people are like, oh my gosh, it's the best marketing plan ever to leak it. And I'm like, no, I'm in a hockey game, like hyperventilating that it's leaking because we knew we thought it would leak when the book got to the retailers. So we thought it would leak maybe the week before release. And so I've got, there's a copy of it right back here. Uh, and I'm pointing that people can see me. Um, I have a copy of it and I brought it home from the warehouse to film a video that was like, guys, what guys, it's here. Thinking it would leak right around like now or next week. And so I was at a hockey game with watching one of my kids play when it really kind of leaked out. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not even home to make a video. I'm not even home to do this. I can't, it just, it was wild. Just wild. Yeah. I've never seen anything quite like it, which is kind of cool. I'm working in the book industry and adjacent to publishing where, right. People will just are just pre-ordering something that's completely untitled. We don't really have any information and you're like, we're just going to take a chance. <laughs> you know, and I was so worried they'd be disappointed. Um, cause I saw some of the theories that it was like additional material or like not meaning because there, there's two scenes from Zayden's POV in it. Um, which if anyone listening, they're going to be up on my website once the edition sells out. But that was the deal we made with the retailers because I I'm I just believe in if if I'm writing extra content, I'd like to make that as accessible as possible. And being trad published, I don't always get to say, but this time my publisher is, is awesome. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. Um, but it does have extra content. But I saw things like, oh, maybe it's the book of Brennan or maybe it's this. And all I could think was people are going to be so disappointed. So I was really relieved when when the majority of people were not. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, And I think that, I mean, like I was trying to like look in Edelweiss for the ISBN and like figure it out. And um, I couldn't, I was like, it has to be something related, but we'll just wait and see. And so I was happy to see the announcement video. I was like, yep, happy we (laughs) pre-ordered. I know. I I thought it'd be like a fun, like surprise. And instead it was like, you guys were right. Holy (laughs) Like, really? You should freelance for the FBI. Give them a call. Mm-hmm. They probably need your help. <laughs> yeah. Readers yeah. are, I mean, myself included, were very intense. <laughs> it was amazing, though. I was I was super proud of the readers. Yeah. I was super proud. I was like, dang, you guys are way smarter than I am. Like, <laughs> the way everyone's delving in, I'm like, this is, you guys are amazing. Well, very impressed by the folks that caught, like, your name on a retailer. Like, we're, we're just refreshing, like, every. I know. <laughs> I know. And then, you know, you get this moment of frustration because you're like, no. but yeah. then you're also like, well, all right, we're going to roll with it. <laughs> like yep. you can't, you know. Yeah. It was still a nice surprise and right. Like you couldn't, you couldn't buy that marketing. It like, it's just the fans are so like excited to figure it out. It was kind of cool to see, but it just absolutely took off. I feel like so much of it has been a perfect storm. Everything from the dragon edges. Cause like they printed over six figures in dragon edges, right? And the pre-order numbers, because it's my first fantasy, they they didn't really justify it. Like my publisher was taking a big risk in how many Dragon Edges they printed. And then they sold out of the warehouse in three days. So like, I feel like it's all just been this perfect storm of no one, no one was expecting, you know, how, how it's happened. And it just, I'm hoping at, at one point we will maybe start 
start to expect, but right now we're all just like, Hey, this is great. Rolling along. Yeah. You're just along for the ride for yes. sure. <laughs> I often say that the book is the hurricane and, and, and I'm the Island. Like, because I am just like, I'm just holding on for dear, for dear life in, in, in the book. That's really all you can do. I feel like I can't imagine just like what the, what a roller coaster ride it's been like 2023 has been, I think pretty yeah. huge for you. <laughs> we talked a little bit about um, having a more manageable writing schedule. And so I'm interested to know if there's anything that you can share about what you're working on right now. Sure. I'm working on a contemporary romance. I like to go back and forth between contemporary and fantasy. It keeps my brain fresh. And it allows me to read what I want to read. Because when I'm working on contemporary, I typically read fantasy, um, even though I'm reading a nonfiction right now. Um, and usually when I'm reading or when I'm working on fantasy, I read contemporary. So so nothing like accidentally bleeds in, right? Um, and just the way my brain functions better. Because I love contemporary stories that have angst and have family issues and all those kinds of things. So I'm working on a um, a contemporary romance that I think is slated for... I want to say the fall, but I also don't want to <laughs> jump on that and have my other publisher be like, it's not. And I'm like, sorry, guys, it's not. But I'm madly in love with it and hope you guys will like it too. Okay. I love that though. I am a romance reader and a fantasy reader. So I agree that sort of going back and forth helps keep things nice and fresh. Because yeah. <laughs> you got to, I think like in fantasy, gosh, you know, your conflicts can come from the dragons, from the external, from the war. And in contemporary, you really have to dig deep to find character motivations. And I feel like both me writing strictly contemporary romance makes me study my characters in fantasy so much harder because that's what we're really focused on in romance. So I think they just, they complement each other really well. They do indeed. And so are we, will we get a tease on book? I'm already talking about book three and book two isn't even out yet. <laughs> no. And like, how long do we have to wait for maybe a title for book three? Not to. Um, I <laughs> no, I have a short list and I kind of know when I know if that makes sense. Like I knew fourth wing was the title and, and we even, it, went, it, was, it had a different title for a hot, like two months that I was like, Okay. Cause you know, you just trust, you trust publisher and trust marketing. And then we went back to fourth wing. Cause I think like when you know, you know, and I don't know, no about the third one yet, but I have a short list. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. We got to have some secrets and some excitement to come. <laughs> like some decision making over here. I think it's more like that. Like I'm not withholding it from anyone. It's more like me, me being like, Oh, I'm working on that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. It hasn't, it hasn't settled yet. No, <laughs> that's Okay. And so I have a couple of fun questions, if you'll indulge me, uh, awesome. that are not related to the books at all, oh, but okay. we just like to be a little bit nosy. Sure. Do you have a go-to cafe or coffee order? Um, I, I just answered this with the hair this morning. So I love mochas and I typically drink peppermint mochas, but my favorite are salted caramel mochas made with oat milk because dairy. Um, but I'm salted, anything salted caramel, I'm done. I'm in it. You've got me. I will walk down the well. I will walk off the cliff like a lemming. I am the salted caramel queen. I love that. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you are currently obsessed with, really enjoying book, TV show. <laughs> okay. Because you're a romance reader. I might, I might bore you. I'm reading this book by Jeff Nussbaum called Undelivered. And it's about speeches and history that weren't delivered. And they are those speeches. So it's 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 talking about like speeches that were supposed to be delivered during the civil rights movement and why they changed and what in historical context made them change right before. And because this speech changed, so did this speech. And then it's about the remarks we give as a society and how it's influenced by politics and history, because I'm a nerd. Um, and it's just really fascinating to see what remarks we're prepared for and then what changes that, that we can't give them and to see what would have been said had context be different, had someone not reached out and said, this speech cannot be as militant as you would like, or we will lose this march. It's, it's, it's really very, it's fascinating. That's really interesting though. Like I'm a nerd. 
You're in good company to, with the professional book nerds. We love getting really nerdy into the things that we enjoy. <laughs> I know. I'm like, it's, it's awesome. And my husband's like, yeah, great. It's awesome. It's cool. And I'm just like, no, really? <laughs> I'm like, look, oh, and it shows you the difference in the speeches. Like, this is what the original was. This is what it, this is, what it is. This is what changed. This is why it changed. And I'm just, oh, I love it. Sorry. Okay. Yes. No, I think that that's really cool as a reader. Like, right. What caused those subtle changes or those big changes yes. and the impact of all of those things yes. and, understanding, those. and understanding how quickly our history can turn on a dime due to a simple, a few simple word choices. Yeah. It is utterly fascinating. It's so cool. We know like words have a lot of power, a lot of yeah. weight. So this, well, I'm not going to ask you that because I just said the most recent book that you've read that wowed you. I think that would definitely apply. Um, I read that. I really, this year I fell in love with Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. So I read Kindred and it just knocked me on my butt. Um, I absolutely loved reading Kindred. I've been reading, um, I've been reading some, I think if I mispronounce, is it Kathy Mara? Is that, is that her name? Some romance. I've been reading some some romance. I've been reading, um, oh, I can just turn around and look at my, (laughs) I have an entire list back there. Um, I read Legendborn, which I really loved this year. Um, And I'm also reading The History of a Difficult Child. So I read like four or five books. Oh, in seven years, seven, seven weeks in June, seven days in June, seven days in June. I'm I'm listening to that on Audible. So I typically juggle three to four books at a time. That's impressive. Uh, As someone that has to read one thing at a time, I really struggle when I try to do more. I have attention deficit disorder. I have um, an intensive type. So it's, I have to have a book in every location. So like listening to seven days in June is like, I'm on the plane or I'm walking through the airport or the other one I'm reading in bed or the other one I'm reading, you know, down here in my office. Like it's just, I just have different books everywhere. We love that. The more books, the better. I wanted to ask you one final question. And again, we we can't, we don't want to spoil anything for anybody because people are absolutely dying to read Iron Flame. But um, is there anything that you would want readers to take away from Iron Flame? I don't know if that gives that too much, if that's too much of a spoiler, you know, from Violet and Zayden and all the things that they're going through in this book. I think to take away. Um... I think the point of Iron Flame, like you have a lot of external conflict in Fourth Wing. And I think the Iron Flame has a lot of internal conflict. And I think that it's about drawing healthy boundaries in your relationship and who you choose to trust with what and how we deal with the secrets our friends reveal to us. And I I had to say one thing to take away. It's, I would say, choose your friends wisely. I would say, I, I, I mean, I don't even think that. I think mostly it's, you before you can trust someone else, you really have to trust yourself. And until you can trust yourself, you can trust no one else. Amazing. I think that that's very fitting. Thank you so much for coming to chat with me today. It's been an absolute delight. Okay, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on overdrive.com and our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen podcasts, visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com.